I'm Colin. And I'm Megan. And this is Pet Sitter Sitter Confessional. Confessional. An open and honest discussion about life as a pet sitter. Brought to you by Time to Pet. On this week's episode, we have a very special guest. You've probably read one of her many books, taken her course, seen her on national TV, or listened to her very own podcast. Kristen Morrison is with us this week to talk about running and growing a pet care business. From how she got started to when she eventually sold her business and everything in between. A quick note, we did record this conversation before the COVID-19 outbreak across the globe. So our conversation around the current status of the market is outdated. However, I do hope that that portion of the conversation is uplifting and encouraging to you as we look forward to brighter days in our industry. And with that, let's dive right in. I'm so happy to be here today, Colin. Thank you for your invitation. I appreciate that. So I, I started my own pet sitting and dog walking business many years ago in 1995, and I had it for 18 years. And about five years into running my own business, I had a few pet sitters from around the country ask if I would be willing to help them grow their businesses. So in the year 2000, I began coaching pet sitters and dog walkers. And so I have been coaching for (laughs) almost 20 years at this point. It kind of blows my mind when I think about it. It feels like yesterday in some ways, but yeah, so I, I'm a business coach for pet sitters, dog walkers, dog trainers, pet groomers, all kind of service-based pet care providers. Mm. Um, I've written a few books and I'm working on actually my sixth book, um, currently. And I offer webinars and I just really am passionate about helping pet business owners create success. And it's not just about money. A lot of people look at, oh, Kristen, you own Six Figure Pet Business Academy. Yes, I am absolutely passionate about people making a great income, doing something they love. That is something that my heart and soul is really invested in and Mm -hmm. excited about. But to me, it's so much more than just the money. It's really quality of life. A lot of pet sitters and dog walkers, and and especially, tend to have a really challenging work-life balance. Um, Mm. It's skewed in terms of them working a lot and not having a personal life. And I experienced that in my own business, in my own life. And so I really did a lot of inner and outer work around that to Uh, create a life that I loved that, you know, where my business was a wonderful addition to my life, but it wasn't the whole of my life. Mm. So that's a little bit about me (laughs) and what I do. (laughs) Yeah, because most of us, uh, I just for me personally, I guess, um, didn't start off to run a pet business. We got in it because we love taking care of animals. And then yep. this, this business monster kind of yes. comes along with you uh, <laughs> that, well that, said. <laughs> that you, that you yeah. all of a sudden have to manage. And that's, you know, we all, we find ourselves in that position. And, and so there's always a lot of questions about, you know, I, I have this passion of, of, of taking care of animals. You know, what's some of the best ways to be a manager of a business? Um, in in, in the pet care business, uh, particularly? Yeah. So when I think of manager, I think about somebody actually running the business rather than doing the services of the business, Mm -hmm. like pet sitting and dog walking. So maybe you've stepped away from doing the actual services. Yeah. What I found in my own business is that I actually needed to do those services for a year or two before I could begin to step away from or begin to hire people and then eventually step away from doing the actual services. And, you know, I find that it's really important for people to actually experience doing those services before they make that leap. Mm. Um, That being said, there is an experience of, you know, in addition to doing these services, even before you've hired, there's a lot of administration tasks that you have to do. And that can be like a juggling act for people that are especially not used to it and not 
you know, into multitasking, (laughs) it can just be a super big challenge and I get it. And so what I've found that's been really helpful for me, as well as a lot of my coaching clients is to get hyper organized, uber Mm. organized, you know, and what does that look like? So what it might look like for some people is really figuring out, okay, what day are you going to focus on marketing? Mm. You know, maybe you set aside three hours on Monday where, you know, you clear the decks of your schedule and that is all about marketing, whether it be social media, you know, pounding the pavement, going to talk to vets, groomers, pet store owners, you know, really cultivating relationships in terms of networking to grow your business, things like that. And maybe billing clients is another day or twice a week where you stay on on track with that. So what I found for my own for my own self is that if I can get really clear about my schedule and not everything, you know, once you set a schedule, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're definitely going to follow that every single day, week or month, but it absolutely helps to really put whatever you need to do in your calendar rather than, you know, what I hear from a lot of pet sitters is when I'm coaching them is, oh my gosh, I don't even know what to work on today. Mm. Well, you know, (laughs) part of that could be helped if you really look at, you know, write down all the tasks that you need to do on a sheet of paper, you know, really simplify it and then start to designate days of the week, times of the week to actually work on those particular things. And the more organized you can get, the less fires you're going to have to be putting out. Right. And fires can be such a pain in the butt <laughs> to have to deal with, you yeah. know, yeah. They, they cause a lot of drama and the less you can, you know, the more you can kind of put the drama aside and just begin to get really uber organized. It makes such a difference. Yeah. I love that idea of once you get organized setting aside certain times of the day to work on certain tasks because as small business runners and operators, we wear all the hats all the time sometimes. And to to have, like you said, set aside today, you know, for three hours today, I'm doing networking for three hours tomorrow. I'm doing, you know, I'm, I'm pounding the pavement for the next day I'm doing billing. And, and then that, that way you don't, you know, you know, you're going to get to it. It's on the schedule and you're not constantly worried about doing everything all the time because that's, that's impossible as a, as a a one person show. And that's a good point that you bring up Colin, because I do feel like when we can get really organized in our schedule, it does create some peace in our brain. Mm. That part of our brain as business owners, we're like, oh my God, I have so much to do. What do I need to do today? What do I need? You know, we get panicky or we can get panicky. And so it can really kind of soothe that part of our brain that is feeling really stressed out about all the many tasks that we have to do. We get to put our brain in a hammock for a bit. Like, (laughs) don't worry, sweetheart. You know, don't worry, brain. You're good. You're going to be able to work on that on Monday all as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's like, you know, putting something on your calendar. It's like, I'm not putting it there to remember it today. I'm putting it there so that my brain, you know, my brain is good at creating. It's not good at remembering these things. So get it written down, get it somewhere so that you can go back to it and um, know where everything is. That's right. So um, you're you're currently doing business coaching, but as you mentioned, you know you did start out in the pet care business. Um, do you remember your first client? Yes, <laughs> I do. Um, actually, it was my neighbor's. <laughs> let me see if I can get this right. <laughs> my neighbor's best friend's mom. <laughs> so she, <laughs> um, this client lived gosh, maybe about 10 doors down from me. And she had two dogs, Daisy and Bailey. Daisy was a golden retriever. Bailey was a sheepdog mix, Mm. very stubborn dog. That one did not like to walk at all, (laughs) which was challenging to walk both of them because one didn't want to walk and one really did want to walk. But that was my first client. Mm. And, um, I remember, I mean, this was in 1995, so it was many years ago, but still I totally undercharged them. I 
charged them five dollars a walk. Oh my goodness! Oh. <laughs> for a thirty-minute walk, and even at that time, you know, five dollars would be like it was just so low. But I felt so grateful that I mm-hmm. actually had a client. Yeah, I just I felt like I should be paying them because I was so excited to be able to get paid to exercise and be around dogs. And I see that a lot in my my work with my coaching clients is when they're first starting out, they really undercharge. They mm-hmm. made the same mistake that I make. And then it's really hard to raise them. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, that was my first client. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> well, even, you know, even there, you, you know, you're able to look back and, and, and learn from that. And, yes. and I think that's so valuable that um, when we're, when we're running our businesses, taking that time to to look back and think back to those experiences to learn and grow from them, because that undercharging, I, I feel like that's a chronic problem in the pet care yes, business. It is. And, and it's, it is, you're always afraid to ask for more. And I was wondering, you know, if you've thought about why that is and why that, you know, may be a particular problem to pet care. Yes. Two things about this that I want to mention. Um, one is a lot of people run their business as if it's a nonprofit. Mm. And it's really important to remember that it is a for-profit venture. Yeah. Um, this is going to support you and maybe your family too, if you have a family. And so it's really important to value your time, your energy, your attention. Um, I think it's a problem in the pet care industry because people that are drawn to becoming pet care providers tend to have a really caring and nurturing spirit mm. and a very loving heart, which is great. Yeah. We want that. That's the kind of person that's going to be a good fit for this industry. However, the flip side of that, the shadow side of that is really not feeling like you can charge a lot, feeling sheepish about charging for something that you're maybe very passionate about, really happy to be doing. Mm -hmm. And yet it's important to kind of take that out of the equation and realize this is a valuable service that you're offering clients. It's, you know, time is, is one of the most precious resources that we have Mm -hmm. in our lifetime, right? Mm -hmm. Is each minute, each hour, each day, where are you putting your energy, your attention? Mm -hmm. And part of that is to your work and you can never get that back. You can never get your time back. It's one of those resources that once you use it, In that particular moment, it is gone. And so it's so important to really realize and kind of wake up to the fact that, you know, if you're not charging what your time and energy are worth, you can't ever get that back. (laughs) So I really want to encourage those pet sitters and dog walkers who are listening to this, who perhaps haven't raised their rates in a number of years or who are just starting out and feeling like, oh, I need to charge just a little bit. I don't Mm -hmm. recommend if you're first starting out that you charge, you know, the top tier that, you know, pet sitters in your area who've been working for 10, 15 years are charging. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to charge a ton, but what you do want to do is really evaluate what the different pet sitters in your area are charging. And go to, let's say the lowest is 15 in your investigative work, you know, Mm -hmm. where you're searching and seeing what people are charging. The lowest is 15, the highest is 20. Maybe you're looking at 18 as a brand new pet sitter. And then you can always raise it. It's harder to lower it. And you don't want to, you don't want to lower it (laughs) (laughs) generally, right? But you do want to eventually raise it. So um, I have a whole tips and tools booklet around raising rates Mm. on my website. It's on the free stuff page. So if they're interested, I'd be happy to have them, you know, scroll to the bottom of that page. And there's a link that says how to write the perfect rate increase letter. Okay. And it has a lot of 
information on there about raising rates. Great. We'll provide uh, links to that in the show notes of the episode here. So everybody has that. Um, Cause yeah, that's a, that's a, that's always a very touchy topic of, it is. of, of how do I do this? When do I do it? To whom do I raise rates? Do I grandfather yeah. people in? And that's, yeah. that's a, can be a, a big monster to try and tackle. Totally. Yeah. Cause this, this, um, this particular industry is very much one of those of, I could do it, quote unquote, for free, because who who wouldn't yeah. want to spend time with puppies and I know. cats, right? It's, <laughs> but but knowing that time spent away, as you mentioned, comes at a very real cost to you and your family, and to make sure that you are valuing valuing your time and the mm-hmm. the effort that you're putting into that. You've been in the pet sitting industry since you said the mid '90s. Um, mm-hmm. How would you say, or what are some of the biggest changes to the pet sitting industry that have taken place since then? Well, people are much more aware of it now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember going to parties in the you know late 90s, and this was when I had my business for a few years at that point, and people would ask what I did for a living, and I would say, oh, I own a pet sitting and dog walking business, and they would like cock their head like a bird, like, huh? <laughs> and <laughs> I had to explain, <laughs> you know, at that point, there were three pet sitters, professional pet sitters in my county. Now there are probably hundreds. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, you know, we've done a lot of the hard work for you guys who are just starting out the heavy lifting of educating people on mm-hmm. what a pet sitter and dog walker is, and yeah. that it's a, actually a service that people need. And you know, can get a lot of value from. Um, so I think that's one way is just, you don't, you guys who are just starting out, don't have to educate people on, on what it is that you do. Yeah. Um, but not only that, I mean, there've been some really major changes in terms of social media and that being such a huge way of gaining clients yeah. and a really important way um, to get new clients and also to stay in regular communication with your clients. That being said, it's also been a challenge for a lot of pet sitters and dog walkers in terms of, again, going back to valuing your time, they can get really sucked into that social media rabbit hole. Right. And so, you know, that's been an interesting dance that I've seen in terms of you know, it being such a blessing to have this social media, but then it can also be the curse, right? Oh my God, I've been on social media for three hours. Where's my life going? (laughs) Again, talking about that valuable, precious resource of time that we can never get back once we've used it. So that's one thing. Also, of course, the WAG and Rover apps Mm -hmm. weren't around in the mid nineties. And so we didn't have that compassion competition in terms of, you know, a lot of people these days want that really instant gratification of like clicking a button, getting a sitter, boom, it's done. You know, people are super busy. And so it's really important for pet sitters and dog walkers these days to be, you know, really easily accessible. Yeah. What does that look like? So what it looks like is having software that can kind of match that, match that app aspect. A lot of softwares these days have an app where people can actually click on it and get to your particular login for your software, you know, and that can help you with that cutting edge software that's really needed um, to make it really easy for your clients. Also. Um, returning client calls promptly is really important Mm. in terms of, you know, just and emails, just really being in regular communication with your clients in the way that they need. I think, yeah. So those are some big changes that I've witnessed. Just a few of those changes. There's been a lot, but yeah. Yeah. You you touched on social media there as far as how important it is and some of the pitfalls, because we can, you you very easily see you can spend all of your time posting pictures of cute dogs, but not doing yeah. the actual business stuff and, you know, engaging on there and trying yeah. to judge that what's an engagement on Instagram worth versus an engagement with somebody on the sidewalk that you can hand a business card to. And, and what is that value that it gives back to your, your business? Yes. And I think they're both very important mm-hmm. and it's not perhaps one or the other. I think 
the more marketing you can do in many different areas, I call it casting the marketing net wide Mm. as if you're fishing, you know, Mm -hmm. it's not just um, search engine optimization or Facebook marketing. It's really about making yourself available kind of everywhere. I mean, one of the greatest compliments you can get as a business owner that's been marketing a lot is I see you everywhere. Yeah. You know, when you start to hear that, you know that you are doing something right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that should be very um, gratifying to you yep. to, be, to know that you're popping up first. You're, you're, you know, you're the one that people see first and foremost everywhere they go. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So other than social media as kind of this new opportunity that, that we have these days, what are some other things uh, that pet business, pet care businesses have at their disposal that um, are, are good and positive? as um, these days? Well, um, I'm not sure I I totally understand your question, but I'm going to answer it in the way that I'm hearing it. (laughs) Okay, yeah. Um, So one of the things that I see is very positive is that I see the pet industry continuing to grow and grow and grow. I see it um, having unlimited possibility and potential. And here's why. When I started my business, like I said, in in the mid-90s, Pets were not considered kids the way they are today for Mm. most people. Um, They are very much revered, (laughs) for lack of a better word, um, all over the world these days, Mm -hmm. it seems, which is wonderful. And it means that people are really valuing their pets Mm. and they're treating them with respect and care and love. and, And with that comes the desire and ability and willingness to put money where their heart is, <laughs> you know, so they're willing to pay for pet sitters and dog walkers and groomers. Right. And I think, you know, a lot of people think, oh, there are too many pet sitters and dog walkers in my area. I probably shouldn't even try. There are so many pets. Yeah. <laughs> worry about it. You know, one of the greatest things, Colin, I was in Arizona recently attending the Day of the Dog Festival, which is such a fun festival. It's kind of all over the country now. So if anybody gets a chance to go, I really recommend it. But I met a lot of Arizona pet sitters there. Mm -hmm. And um, what they all said, and they they weren't all together. I met them at various times when I was there at the festival. Mm -hmm. What they all said to me in one way or another was, we have so much business that there is no competition. Wow. And, you know, that isn't true every single area. I get that. You know, maybe in rural areas, it's going to be a little harder. You don't have as much population um, clients, you know, potential clients. But what I've seen in most of the cities is that that is true. And what happens is we get in our own way in terms of, oh, there's too much competition, or we start focusing on the competition, put your energy back in your own business. Mm -hmm. Yes, (laughs) You know, really put your blinders on, focus on your own business. And really, again, the, the possibilities are unlimited. But when your energy is in somebody else's business, it's not in yours. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's kind of where I was, I was, I was hoping you would take that question as far as yeah. when we talk about opportunities is that it is, it is growing and is still growing. I remember Absolutely. one of the stats that really struck me was during the recession that we had now 15 years ago at this point, the pet care industry was one of the only ones to continue to grow yep. through that. And, and, and that, you know, we, we were kind of, when we, my, my wife and I started, we were kind of coming, that was kind of towards the tail end of the the recession, but it was still booming and growing like gangbusters. Yes. And it was just like, okay, this is a good place to be because as more people get educated, you know, even if you're in a town of 20,000 people, 10,000 people, even if 10% of those people have pets that's still a huge market that you alone won't be able to fill. So there's, um, yep. you know, there's always room for, for more and, and different services too. Um, because mm-hmm. as one single pet sitter, you know, running your business, you won't be able to meet everybody's individualistic needs. And so there are a lot of niche markets within the pet care industry too, to, to, to seek out and to, to specialize in. That's a good point. You know, I coached someone 
a few weeks ago who just has a wedding um, assistant business. So she is a caretaker for dogs at weddings. And that is the only thing she does. Whoa. (laughs) (laughs) I know. I know. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) I know. So, so, I mean, that's a great example of this. The diversity is there. the, the, The numbers are there. And so the opportunities go along with that. That's right. So if you were starting a pet care business today, um, or maybe deciding to go out on your own, maybe you've been working with a Rover and WAG Mm -hmm. and you're deciding to go on your own, what are some things that you need to really consider and think about step one or two or maybe step zero? Yes. So step zero is actually thinking about the name. Mm. And names are really, really important. They're more important than most people think. Yeah, It's how people identify you. It really sets the stage for your business. And it's important to really think way into the future before you're even ready to do that, right? Yeah. yeah. But, <laughs> so, you know, it may seem strange and counterintuitive, but it's really important to look well into the future to think, do I want to, do I see myself staying in my little town or my county? Mm-hmm. You know, maybe in 10 years, you might want to actually franchise your business at some point. Mm-hmm. So if you call your business the city that it's in, like San Francisco pet sitting, that might not be relevant if you decide to franchise down the road. Yeah. And in the same vein, Calling your business, naming your business after your own personal name can be challenging too, because it can be hard to hire people. Uh Because if you have Joe's pet sitting and you want to hire people, a lot of your clients are going to go, but I want Joe. (laughs) I don't want Julie. I want Joe. I want the owner, you know? So it's really important to actually be very conscious when you're naming your name and really think well into the future about that. And then of course, to get business insurance, that's something that is crucial before you've taken your first client, get business insurance. I recommend that you get bonding insurance, which is for theft. Mm. Um, And you may think, well, uh, what if it's just me? Why would I need that? I know I'm not going to steal anything. Your clients don't know that. Yeah. And it sets them at ease. Mm-hmm. You know, seeing insured and bonded on your website is going to help them feel more comfortable and more trusting of you, a stranger that they're inviting yeah. into their home. Yes. So that's really important. It's also important to get software, um, administration software for your business, not necessarily immediately upon starting, but as you're growing, it's going to create a container for you to grow. Yeah. That's important. Yeah. And making sure you start setting up that, that scaffolding, that good foundation so that as you build, you don't have to suddenly, you know, you know, duct tape all these other, you know, quick fixes and patches to the way you run your business and spending all that time up front. To yes. really think about that is is you will be thanking yourself years down the line. <laughs> You're right. That's well said. It's worth the time and energy to invest that time and energy in the beginning. Have you heard about Time to Pet? Susan from the Pet Gal has this to say. Time to Pet has helped us grow exponentially. We believe the platform's features make us by far more professional than other companies who use conventional dashboards. They are the software gurus constantly developing and improving the platform based on user feedback. This decision was a good one. If you are looking for new pet sitting software for your business, give Time to Pet a try. As a listener of Pet Sitter Confessional, you'll get 50% off your first three months when you sign up at timetopet.com slash confessional. Now, you've written quite extensively on starting and running pet care businesses, and one of your books and materials that you have is on hiring and retaining really good employees. Yeah. Um, what's something that you've, you learned when you hired your first employee, and how did it change how you thought about employees after that? Yeah. So I didn't know how to hire when I hired. (laughs) I had never, I had always had bosses, but I'd never been a boss. So I was not a very good boss in the beginning. I really 
was excited about being a boss. I like the sound of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> but don't we all? <laughs> I, yeah, but I didn't really know how to be a good boss. So, um, and I didn't know what to look for. Mm. So I just looked for somebody that was interested uh. and that wasn't enough. Um, it was really important. You know, I learned after that, after my first person to really look for somebody that is good with pets and people. Mm-hmm. I thought somebody loving pets was enough. But even if they only see clients once and then they never see them again, that one time interaction is crucial at that meet and greet. Yeah. You know, if they're super shy, um, if they lack confidence, if they're just kind of a challenging personality, but yet they're great with pets, yeah. it might not be a good fit in right. terms of hiring. I've had a lot of people, um, I've hired in my pet sitting business, I hired over 250 people in the course of running my business for 18 years. Wow. When I sold it, I had 35 dog walkers and pet sitters and four managers. So it was a pretty big business. Right. And, you know, what I learned through that process was I had a lot of people want to work for me and say, oh my gosh, I love animals. I don't really like people. Yeah. And they thought that that would be something that would be a good thing to tell me. <laughs> but it's actually the opposite. I was like, okay, you're not going to be a good fit. You no, know? No. <laughs> so, yeah. But they, they saw that as a good thing, you mm-hmm. know? So that's something to really pay attention to. Um, common sense can be tricky to really figure out when you're interviewing if they have it or not. And it's crucial in this business. Right. So, you know, one of the things, one of the ways kind of the screening processes that I did is I created an application packet, which people had to fill out and it was lengthy, Mm. seven pages where they had to fill it out. Yeah. (laughs) And then um, at that point I had them snail mail it, but toward the end of my business, I would have them email it back to me. And what happened with that is two things. It showed a commitment level because they filled out the packet and they, you know, either mailed or emailed it back. But also there were specific questions in there that really helped me determine if they had the ability to follow directions Mm. as well as common sense. So, you know, one of the questions would be list three words that best describe why you would make a great pet sitter or dog walker Mm. with my company. And if they listed three sentences, they were Uh, out. Like I wouldn't even consider them because a lot of your clients write notes, right? About really important information. And if they're not paying attention, not a good, not a good fit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I remember hearing a story of um, a a rock group that when they would go to a show, they would put very lengthy details for their back room. And one of them was like only green M&Ms or something like that because, Uh because they knew if they paid attention to that, the, group, yeah. the people setting up the area would know and would be paying attention to how to set up all of the sound boards and all those little details. So that, it, that, that attention to detail oh. at, is, is, is huge because those letters that, that clients leave for their, for their pets are quite extensive sometimes, as you, <laughs> as you mentioned. Exactly. And, yeah. and, and it can be, if, you know, if you're not careful, you can really get into some uh, hot water there. Exactly. And, you know, regarding the application packet, another question I have on there is, um, how much do you need to make per week doing part-time work with our company? Mm. And so that's another really important note. (laughs) You know, if they're writing a thousand dollars a week, they might not be a good fit. It's not a deal breaker, but it just means that there's an important conversation that needs to be had in order to see if they're the right fit, because you want to be able to give them what they need (laughs) to supplement their income. And for the application packet, so, you know, I created this in my own business. People can absolutely create their own. Um, I also sell one on my site. It's Mm. the one that I used in my own business. So, you know, if we, if you want, we can put a link to that also. Yeah. Yeah. And they can just check it out and find out what's in it. And then they can create their own as well. They don't have to get mine. Sometimes it's just really hard to figure out where do you even start with that. I know. And so exactly. That can be huge. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, so you you were hiring I- employees, correct? And yes. you know so nowadays mm-hmm. there's a, a big conversation between you know hire an employee or bring on an independent contractor. Uh, you know wh- where does your mind kind of go when making those kind of decisions these days? Well, I really think across the board that people need to hire employees. Okay. Um, I am getting more and more. I'm getting more and more calls and emails from pet sitters who are saying they got audited due to misclassification. One uh, pet sitter in particular that I had been really encouraging to convert her ICs to employees almost every single session. I would have a (laughs) conversation with her about this. Um, She just got a bill for $50,000 because she got audited and you know, it's just, you know, she's heading into the holiday season here, really depressed, understandably. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I am just a huge advocate for people converting. And I know it's a pain in the butt. Um, it can cost more for sure. Mm-hmm. It does cost more yeah. than having ICs, unfortunately. But the thing is, you will be able to sleep better at night if you've converted your ICs to employees. And I just can't say enough about it. I just don't want to see anyone else get audited and have to pay penalties and back taxes. It's no fun. Yeah, that's, that sounds like a a, a big mess just waiting to happen and trying to, totally. and so the employee route just sounds like it's kind of a, a, a sure way to make sure that you are, have all of your bases covered without trying to know, you know, what box to check in, on the forms and stuff. Exactly. And there's some easy, I mean, easier ways to do it. So it's good to get an employment attorney who can help you Mm. kind of strategize in terms of what to pay people, you know, how to set up your contracts, all of that. And you can find a low cost employment lawyer by Googling, you know, low cost legal aid and your particular city or the nearest big city. You can also use LegalZoom, which is a prepaid legal service. Yeah. You might even want to check with SCORE, Service Corps of Retired Executives. They often have free assistance. Um, I can't guarantee that they will in every city, but um, they might have an employment lawyer who's retired who can help for free. So, you know, that's one thing. And also a lot of the payroll services are, you know, make, will make your job a lot easier as far as being an administrator. Yeah. Um, It's a headache to do that. So I really recommend paying a company to do it. And it's not very expensive for a lot of companies. It'll be about a hundred dollars, maybe less, maybe a little bit more, and it's totally worth it. Yeah. And it may be hard to see that of, you know, why am I spending a hundred dollars to have somebody do this? But then you hear stories of somebody who didn't do it properly and now they've got huge bills or they've got yep. a lot of problems. So it's kind of like it's you can think of it almost as a form of another insurance to make sure things are done properly and that you don't have something fall back on you. That's a good point. I like that. Yep. Actually, that kind of leads into one of our listener questions. And um, we have a special thank you to Jen and uh, Denise from our Facebook group. And one of those questions um, was, what was the pay structure of your business with employees? And how did you go about getting that set up? Yeah, so my pay structure was half of what I charged at the time. Mm. And that usually works well for most pet business owners who have their rates for their clients <laughs> at what it should be. Uh-huh. Um, so it's important to do that. And again, it's that's why it's important to raise your rates. Yeah. You know, at least every other year, if not every year, even if you raise them just a dollar, you know, a service, yeah. a walk or visit, that can help you continue to raise your staff rates. You know, whenever I raised client rates, my staff rates went up as well. So, you know, that's the way I did it. It's what really worked great for me. It's what has worked well for a lot of my coaching clients. What can be really challenging, and I've worked with a couple of people recently who are paying their staff 50%, or sorry, 70% of Mm. what they're charging. So they're 
their business is making 30, but, you know, after payroll and workers comp, they're actually looking at like 15%. And it's like, why are you even having employees (laughs) if you're going to be, you know, paying that high? And I get it. I really am an advocate for paying your staff as much as you can, Mm -hmm. but it's important to really weigh that in terms of you know, what you're paying them as well as what your business is making. So again, it's kind of this circle of your business life, raising the rates, having, you know, your rates be what they should be in order to pay your staff. And it's like, you know, you have to make sure all of those are working properly in order to come out ahead. Right. Because um, living in isn't getting any cheaper. And so um, business expenses go up every year. And so if, and so doing those small incremental changes can uh, increases can really help because if you don't change it for several years and then all of a sudden you do a 15 or $20 increase, that's that, that your, your clients are not going to be the happiest ones in the world when they see that change for sure. Oh, they yeah. won't stay. Yeah. Most, most of them won't. Right. Um, and you know, an interesting, just a little kind of vision of math around this. So a lot of people think, oh my gosh, $2 a walk. That doesn't sound like much of a, an increase, but here's the simple math around this. Okay. So let's say you have 10 Monday through Friday dog walking clients and you raise them $2 more per walk, you know, Mm -hmm. that is $400 more per month Yeah, without (laughs) doing more work. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that is $4,800 more per year, almost $5,000 just from those 10 clients. Yeah. So when you start to look at the bigger picture and have the bigger vision, it's mind blowing, you know, and a lot of your pet sitters who are listening to this podcast probably have a lot more than 10 clients. Yeah. So they can dramatically increase their revenue without doing more work, except writing a simple email and Mm -hmm. clicking send. Yeah. Yeah. And (laughs) and I, I would encourage any of the listeners that if you haven't sat down and just played with Excel and some numbers and doing some of those $1, $2 increases and and plotting it out one year, two years, five years just to see that difference because it is, it's that big picture idea of it adds up really fast. It does. And I like what you said earlier, Colin, about like, you know, the cost of living goes up and every year that you're not raising your rates, Mm -hmm. that's money that you're leaving on the table. You travel quite extensively giving seminars and and coaching one-on-one to business owners. What are some common themes that you see people struggling with? And what are some ways they can overcome those? Yeah. So um, I'm just thinking hiring is a huge one. Like, Mm. how do I hire great people? We talked about that. Yeah. Well, burnout is huge. Uh Um, And that's a bit like work-life balance, but I get a lot of pet business owners who are contacting me saying, I'm so fried. I don't know. I don't think I want to go on anymore. Mm. And it's affecting their you know, significant relationships, it's affecting their health. Maybe they're eating in the car instead of actually sitting at their dining room table, you know? (laughs) Um, So one of the things that I recommend, like the first place to look at if you're feeling totally burned out is how are you taking care of your body or how are you not taking care of your body? Because mm. everything really stems from that. It's the foundational piece for your business. Just like the name is the foundational piece, your body and your ability to invest your energy yeah. and your time comes from your body and your health. So that's the first place to look at. You know, before you even look at systems and strategies, I really recommend that you start there and look at what are you feeding yourself? You know, almost like if you had a kid who perhaps is having one of those tantrums at 2 2 p.m. because he hasn't had a nap, you know, (laughs) Um, or he's eaten a lot of sugar and he's bouncing off the walls. You know, it's kind of like you parenting yourself and looking at yourself as if you would parent a 
shifted. What do I need to do for myself yeah. in this moment to give myself what I need in order to be there for my business? It's like the oxygen mask on yourself. Everybody talks about that, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. But how do we do it? Yeah. So starting with what are you putting in your body? You know, have you moved recently? I'm talking about working out, you know, and maybe you walk dogs. Maybe you need to do something different. Maybe it's taking a yoga class yeah, or meditating. If that's something that, you know, you think could help you. Yeah. Um, also, one more thing about this is a lot of people who have a pet business are pretty isolated. Mm. You know, they're on the computer a lot a lot of them don't even have partners, <laughs> yeah. you know, because they don't have time to date because <laughs> yeah. they're so busy or they don't have quality time with their partners or their kids. So yeah. I really recommend that in addition to taking care of your body, taking care of your relationships, because those feed us yeah. in nourishing ways that we can't even put words to sometimes. That gets back to what you started off talking about was it's not just about that income. It's not just about that money. It's finding that balance and asking those questions. When was the last time you had a vegetable? When was the last time yeah. you just went and laid, and laid in the grass and felt the exactly. sun on your skin? When did you yes. last sit and have coffee with a friend? It's We get so caught up in pet care business of being busy all the time because yeah. we're busiest when other people aren't working and we're busiest <laughs> when they are taking it's care of, of them. And, yeah. it, you know, running it, you also you know, mentioned earlier, running it as a true business and real businesses have days off. Like That's they, right. They, they close some days. That's it's, right. Yeah. And, and not do being you, afraid to do that. Good point. And, you know, what are your office hours? And if you yeah. don't, have any, it's time to begin to implement them, create them and implement them and stick to them. You know, put your computer in a closet so that it's out of your mind. You put your phone in a drawer, you know, so that you're giving yourself a break. Get yeah. in the bathtub if that's soothing for you, yeah. you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And just finding, finding those moments to, to, yep. Make sure you're okay. And then if you have employees, make sure they're doing the same thing in their That's lives right. too. That's yeah. right. A few more listener questions here. What was it like with the process for you of, of selling your business? Um, and and what, did, you know, what kind of things did you learn from going through that? Yeah. So one of the things I learned is that I didn't interview my business broker. Um, I had never mm. sold a business before. And some questions that I wish I would have asked before I hired this person um, were, what are you going to do to market my business for sale? Mm. And what he did was he just placed it on a website and that was it. And anything oh. else, any other kind of marketing to, and it is marketing when you're selling a business, it's really about getting the word out. Um, in a way that's going to be anonymous because you have to keep it under wraps while yeah. you're putting it out there. So it makes it a little complicated. You know, he, he just put it on that one site and any other kind of marketing that I wanted to do, I would have to pay. Oh. Um, so that's something that I wish I had known to ask and that I would ask if I were to sell so, another business. Yeah. Um, also, how many businesses are you going to represent while you're representing my business and you know what kind of energy and attention are you going to put in and where are you going to find buyers you know and again if i had asked this he would have said oh we're going to find buyers from this one site <laughs> and i would have said well what if that doesn't work right. you know so um and one thing to consider when you are if you do decide to use a business broker and i recommend that you do if your business is generating more than a hundred thousand or more, mm -hmm. um, any less than that, a lot of business brokers won't even take your business. Okay. Um, so just be aware that the commission is going to be anywhere from eight to generally 12% of the purchase price. Okay. And typically it's going to be 10 to 12. It's very rare that it's going to be 8%, but that does happen occasionally in certain areas. Gotcha. Um, once you sign up with that particular business broker or that agency to, to have them sell your business, you have to commit to a certain 
length of time, it's sort of like signing up with a realtor where you mm-hmm. can't look for another realtor. Yeah. So yeah. you're kind of stuck and you're committed. So you want to make sure it's a good fit for you and for your business. So that's something that, you know, I wish I had known. Um, There was a lot of negotiating back and forth with the buyer. And I really had to be um, clear about what I needed and wanted to do in the future Mm -hmm. um, in terms of signing a non-compete clause. One of the things that most people will have to sign is that you're not going to start a pet sitting and dog walking company within a period of time. And I knew that I didn't want to do that again. Yeah. Um, but what I didn't know is if I might want to become a dog trainer or, Mm -hmm. you know, also I'm a coach. So I had to be really clear that I'm going to be able to continue doing that. So it's important to really, that's going to be one of the most important documents that you work out with the buyer is what you can and can't do after the sale of the business and for the length of time. So one of the things that I agreed to, which the buyer insisted, understandably, is that I couldn't coach people in the the two counties that my business was based in, Hmm. um, because then I'm disclosing, you know, my secrets basically (laughs) to her competitors, which totally makes sense. Um, That was uh, for a period of five years. I can now coach people in this area. And I, it's funny because I had people that have literally, they waited and they wrote in their calendar, like five years from oh that day. <laughs> and I got so many calls. Um, it's actually, you know what, a couple days ago was six years that I sold my business. Mm. And, but on that year five, literally like on December 3rd of year five, yeah. I got a bunch of calls and emails from people who were like, you can now coach in the area. Yay. It was so cute. I was like, yes, I can. I love that you were, that you remembered that. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That's, (laughs) that's really sweet. (laughs) It was. Kind of shifting from selling your business kind of towards the the end of running and operating that business towards, you know, there was a, a transition point where you had had, enough of of being burnt out and being tired and 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 having a really bad balance of business and life thinking back what were some of the big changes that you decided right then and there to to make so that it was the kind yeah. of business you wanted to have yeah so that was at about year 6 um i had thought about ending my business either i was thinking about walking away and possibly selling it. But really what I wanted to do was just walk away. I was so fried. Um, So yeah, I I decided I actually, it was very counterintuitive. I decided to commit for one year to really changing the way I ran my business. And I decided Mm. if at the end of that year that things hadn't changed and I wasn't making more money and I didn't have more time Mm. that I'd be out. So it gave me that deadline, which was incredibly powerful. Yeah. Then I was so tired, but that deadline really kind of gave me that second wind to begin to implement strategies to change the way I ran my business. And at that point, I was working seven days a week, sometimes as much as 14 hours a day. I was completely exhausted. I had pet sitters and dog walkers working for me. So it wasn't like, you know, I was doing all the work myself, but I was doing all the admin work myself. Mm. And I was still dog walking a couple days a week. So, you know, one of the things I did is I let go of those two days of dog walking very reluctantly, actually, because I really love those dogs. And I I like that it got me out of the house two days a week and kind of forced me, but I knew that that wasn't the best use of my time and energy. And it was really causing me to have an unhealthy relationship with my business at that point, because I was the owner and I really needed to begin to act more like the business owner who had staff. Mm -hmm. That was my version. Some people may never want to stop walking dogs. And if that's you, great. You know, (laughs) I think that people should do what's right for them. But for me, I really got that I needed to begin to step away from that. So I did that. I also hired a manager Hmm. to help manage my business so that I could begin to get 
completely away from my business and not be returning calls, returning emails. Um, you know, I did a very thorough training of the manager and she was only to contact me in a dire emergency. Mm. Um, because yeah. I knew that if she contacted me, I would be kind of roped back into the business again on my days off. And I really needed a very clear break between my business and my personal life. And so that's what I did. And she was the only one that had access to my personal phone so that any sitters or walkers or clients, none of those people had access to my personal phone. And so that's the phone, the bat phone, <laughs> she would call that in, in an event of an emergency. And yeah. So it was really, I set up a wall, um, a very healthy wall between my clients and staff and me. So mm. that, you know, that wall enabled me to have a personal life again. And I mean, I did a number of other things, including really working with my mindset around believing that I could make a large amount of money by working less. You know, yeah. if we don't believe it can happen, it probably won't. And so I really had to do a lot of uh, mental work around that and really allowing that in. And Within that year, at the end of that year, I went from working seven days a week to working three days a week, and I doubled the amount of money that my business generated, hmm. which was amazing <laughs> to me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and part of that was raising rates. I hadn't done that. You know, yeah. part of it was on the days that I was working those three days, I was really all in. You yeah. know, my energy wasn't dispersed and I wasn't fried. You know, I was fresh on mm -hmm. those days and really able to generate a lot more business and market and hire great people because mm -hmm. I was fresh. Yeah, yeah. You you really started to hand those hats off to other people that you knew yeah. that you trusted, and it was it allowed you to really be more invested in the stuff that you were actually interested in doing when you were doing exactly. Yeah. yeah, I was able to delegate, and that's a hard muscle to learn to use as a business owner, if you're self-employed, there's a reason why a lot of us <laughs> go into self-employment and that's usually because we like control, mm -hmm. you know? So then you have to learn to work with that energy of control. And the key for me was really hiring fantastic people. It still was tricky for me to let go of that control, but I began to really work that muscle and feel more trust and security that I could actually hand these things over when I would see that they would go really well. Yeah. And it enabled me to do that more and more and more. Having that, that team around you really exactly. helps. It really is, is just, you know, priceless at that point. It is. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, how are you spending your days these, these days? And, and what does your, your, your current business look like? Yes. Yeah, so I, I no longer have my pet sitting and dog walking business. Um, mm -hmm. I do coaching a couple days a week and I do both something called best year yet coaching where I help people create the best year that they've ever had. And I mm -hmm. help them create 10 goals and really create a annual and monthly and weekly plan to be able to create those goals. And part of that is having personal goals and business goals, not just having business goals. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing I do. I also do pet business coaching. So it's very specific for the pet business. Um, I have a podcast, like, mm -hmm. like you mentioned, uh, the Prosperous Pet Business Podcast. So I record that. Um, I do a monthly webinar each month for pet business owners. Um, I also am writing my next book. So I'm at work on that. And I'm also in the midst of creating a course, which is uh, the 30 day pet sitting and dog walking challenge, which starts mm. January 2nd. So this podcast might miss that, but yeah. I'll be offering it again um, in the coming year, most likely. And uh, yeah, so and I also have a very rich personal life. Mm. I have a lot of friends. I have a wonderful husband that I love spending time with. Um, we just moved to a really cool area. Um, it's very unusual. It's 
on a boardwalk. So our house is, uh, the backyard is on the water mm. and the front yard is on a 600 acre uh, bird sanctuary. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh my and so, so <laughs> it takes us five minutes, five to six minutes to actually walk to our house because it's on a boardwalk. Mm -hmm. Our house is on stilts. And oh. it's on a boardwalk. So, you know, I park the car and I walk um, and we have carts. That's the way we do our groceries <laughs> and, you know, everything. And yeah. it's amazing community out here. Um, wow. So it's been such a delight to get to know my neighbors and everybody's very kind of unusual because they like living out here. There are 50 homes. Yeah. And um, so it's <laughs> just been such a pleasure to kind of get to know this new area and explore it and i'm becoming an avid bird watcher which oh. is really surprising to me <laughs> it sounds so nerdy and so boring but it is not like you know there are so many egrets and canadian geese mm -hmm. and blue herons and i'm just finding myself incredibly passionate about uh -huh. birds <laughs> well i i'd kind of hope so if you're living that close to a bird sanctuary but i know <laughs> it's funny it's funny so when we moved in somebody said you either like boats or birds ah. and we said well what if we like both because we have a, a boat dock you know yes and they're like yeah you can like both that's sure. okay sure why not <laughs> <laughs> that's great yeah it's really cool yeah. Well, well, Kristen, thank mm -hmm. you so much for coming on today I, I, and, and sharing um, from your experiences and, and, you know, what you're doing these days. And I, I know we've barely covered what it's like and, and how to run a pet care business. And people are going to have a lot of questions or maybe interested <laughs> in pursuing some coaching. So yeah. um, how can people get in touch with you and find out more about making sure they're running their business the best way they can be? Sure. So my website is Six Figure Pet Business Academy, and I also have Six Figure Pet Sitting Academy. They can just type that in the search engine and I will pop up. Mm -hmm. um, Kristen Morrison is my name and it's spelled K-R-I-S-T-I-N, not E-N, uh -huh. like a lot of people uh, <laughs> put it in. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to help people that are struggling. Also, my books are all, all on Amazon. I have five books. Um, that are in paperback, and I have the ebook and audiobooks on my site as well. And I look forward to helping people in whatever method they would like my help. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll have those in, in our show notes here so people can click right to those. Again, Kristen, thank you so much for coming on. I've learned a lot and have a lot to put into practice now. So we're, <laughs> we're good. To I'm be. so glad, Colin. Thank you for your great questions. You're a great interviewer. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it the candid response from Kristen to several of those questions and her opening up, especially about how she sold her business and what that process looked like for her. I also really liked her response to the question about what pet care owners are talking about as she travels and burnout was the really big topic there. It's something we all experience and it's something that there are ways to handle and deal with. Reach out to Kristen with more questions, follow up, and check out those resources in the show notes for this week. And we want to thank our sponsor, Time to Pet. Go to timetopet.com forward slash confessional for 50% off your first three months with them. Check out our website for past episodes and detailed notes for each episode that we have. And if you have a story you want told or comments or questions, send it to feedback at petsitterconfessional.com. Thank <laughs> you.